वॉचिंग डेली डिब्रीफ ब्रॉट यू बाई पीपल्स डिस्पैच एंड प्रज्ञा द कॉन्फ्लिक्ट इन यमन हैज कम्प्लीटेड एट ईयर्स टूडे वी डिस्कस द कंट्रीज वर्स दैन एवर ह्यूमैनिटेरियन क्राइसिस we go next to the united states which wants to spend 7.1 billion dollars over 20 years in three pacific island nations as it seeks to renew cofas its compacts of free association with the marshall islands palau and the federated states of micronesia and in sports we look at trans women athletes dealt a blow by the world athletics council the saudi arabia led interventions in yemen started on 26 march 2015 Eight years on, the crisis in Yemen has reached gigantic proportions. The humanitarian distress has made Yemen among the poorest countries. Saudi airstrikes dealt a blow to Yemen's people and its economy. International organizations have called Yemen's crisis the worst in recent history, especially its refugee crisis. What is the situation in Yemen today? Is it likely to change for the better in coming months? Abdul from People's Dispatch is in the studio with us. Abdul. Eight years of the war in Yemen. Can you tell us what has been the impact on the people of Yemen, on the infrastructure in Yemen? What is the scale of the devastation we are talking about? Uh, the scale is, if we want to discuss uh, the devastation of Yemen, if if you see the UN statement about Yemen being world's uh, the worst humanitarian crisis of the century. Uh, that explains everything. The, Yemen, bef even before the war, was one of the poorest countries in the world and the poorest country in the Arab, in the Arab world. And since the war, it, more than 95% of its population has slipped under the poverty line. Uh, uh, millions of Yemenis, there is 33 million is the actual population, it, but more than 80%, it means 26 to 27 million of Yemenis are dependent today on some kind of aid, whether it is provided by the UN or, and most of the cases not, the aid is not reaching them primarily because of the blockade imposed by the Saudi-led Saudi, uh, uh, Saudi -led international coalition. So uh, that is one. Then thousands of Yemeni children have been killed in these uh, eight years of war. According to the UN's own uh, figure, more than 11,000 children have been killed. Since 2015, and uh, but that is uh, the figure which is verified. Uh, there are uh, thousands of more which the the, uh, the children who have died. There is no uh, official record for it. And if you see the 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 dis, uh, you can uh, disparities between the figures uh, proposed by the UN, which mm -hmm. says that around 377,000 uh, Yemenis have been killed since 2015, since the war began, uh, till 2021, uh, end of 21. That is the official figure we have. But the Yemeni government claims that more than 1.5 million Yemenis have been killed in this period. And this, when we talk about people killed in this uh, eight years period, we are not talking only about the people who are killed directly due to the war means right. uh, air strikes carried out by the uh, uh, saudi arabia inside yemen or during the actual uh, uh, ground uh, war uh, we are also talking about the uh, causes created by the blockade which has basically impacted in because yemen is predominantly uh, uh, yemen's economy predominantly is import based Right. Uh, the grain, the food grains, uh, medicine, all the essential commodities, most of the essential commodities crum come from outside. Uh, and because of the blockade, uh, sea, air, land blockade imposed by Saudi Arabia, the imports have been uh, affected. Of course, there is no, the government is also not in a position to buy, uh, uh, impo to import goods from outside, primarily because the economy has collapsed. And whatever natural resources uh, Yemen has, they are basically uh, uh, most of the time are under the con under conflict. Either okay. uh, Saudi-led coalition controls it, then Houthis control control them sometimes. And because of that fight, they are most of most of the time are not uh, available. The revenue from them is not available uh, uh, f uh, f to buy goods from outside. So all of this in total has led to the death of uh, hundreds of thousands of Yemenis 
uh, uh, poverty, widespread poverty, almost the entire population is under the poverty line. And uh, uh, this has also led to uh, a, a larger uh, uh, destruction of the basic uh, infrastructure required for a human civilization in Yemen. Right, uh, Abdullah. And, and the thing is that the war continues. Is there any chance, especially from recent developments, that uh, the position of the countries involved will change and there's a hope for peace? Yeah, yeah. The, it seems that there is an uh, 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 opportunity at this moment uh, to kind of uh, uh, to, uh, end the war and kind of achieve peace in Yemen. Primarily uh, uh, because of the, uh, the, the recent uh, uh, development, which basically is very crucial. The right. rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, of course, mediated by China, Chinese, that is that creates a, a greater possibility of peace in, in Yemen. Primarily because the war in Yemen started in 2015, uh, because Saudis claimed that the rise of the Houthis in Yemen is basically a rise of Iranian influence. And since Iran is a hostile country, the rise of Houthis in the neighborhood basically creates a security threat to them. So that was the justifications Saudis had uh, proposed. And since now, now they, there is a, a possibility that they will, uh, their hostility will, uh, will be reduced because of the restor restor restoration of diplomatic relations that may lead to uh, uh, have some kind of impact on uh, the war in Yemen as well. Also, uh, since uh, last year, when there, there was an UN-led uh, 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 ceasefire, f f which was also a rarity, right. uh, uh, which lasted only for six months, uh, officially, uh, formally, but uh, ever since the ceasefire, there has been no uh, big uh, escalation uh, from both the sides, from the Houthis and from the uh, Saudis. So there has been a relative calm uh, in Yemen since last uh, April. And that basically provides an opportunity for both the both the sides to start talking about uh, making this particular state permanent. Uh, and uh, by the way, Yama, uh, Omanis have basically mediated a few rounds of talks between uh, uh, Houthis and Saudi-led coalition. So there are uh, multiple channels open uh, for talks and in particular because of the restoration of diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran, there is a greater possibility that the war will end in Yemen. But these are all uh, uh, speculations. We are not sure whether this will be a reality or not. All right, Abdul, and thanks very much for joining us with that update. Since the 1980s, the United States has sought to retain what it calls responsibility for the defense of a massive area in the Pacific Ocean. In fact, its COFAs with three island nations, the Marshall Islands, Palau and the Federated States of Micronesia, have allowed it exclusive economic access to those zones. Now it is renegotiating terms with them to extend these arrangements and it may entail a $6.5 billion budget and counting. A Nation People's Dispatch joins us over video conference on what the COFAs really are about. Anish, good to have you back on our show. Anish, the United States wants to spend $7.1 billion. Why? And what are the arrangements it has with these three countries? Yeah, so we need to take a brief look at the uh, history of these three islands and their relationship with the United States. Uh, between uh, since 1945 and until about the late 80s, in the case of Palau until 1994, uh, these three countries uh, remain under uh, a sort of trusteeship uh, that was sanctioned by the United Nations under the United States. Now, the trusteeship was basically uh, the thing that existed. Uh, it came with the League of Nations, uh, which by which a bigger country uh, would administer a smaller country in their neighborhood or in the general area and uh, until they can have the capability to self-govern. Most of the cases, it was just basically uh, a sort of uh, UN sanctioned colonial arrangement in many ways. Because right after the, uh, the takeover of the trusteeship, uh, these three countries, especially Marshall Islands, um, was the uh, you know the hotspot for U.S. nuclear experiments and tests, 
about 46 experiments were conducted in the late 40s and the 50s, and uh, including the biggest uh, US nuclear military test ever. And so the detonation of the biggest uh, US nuclear bomb, and uh, the effects of which are still uh, you know, felt in the region by the inhabitants. Now, this is the brief history. And it took about uh, until the later part of the 80s for these countries to have, you know, at least nominal sovereignty uh, from the United States to have, you know, sovereign uh, uh, state uh, of themselves. And uh, but is even then uh, the defense was pretty much administered by the United States uh, in what is now what, as you pointed out, is the COFA the Compact of Free Association with these three countries. Uh, the United States wants to continue because this Compact of Free Association is going to uh, end uh, for two of them uh, by this year, later this year, uh, for Palau in 2024. So the United States wants to continue this for maybe another 20 years. And for that, obviously, it has to offer something that it had never given or never really bothered to give much attention to in the past several decades since the uh, the COFA came into effect, which is development aid, developmental aid, because many of these countries have been held back developmentally because they remained, uh, you know, dependent on the U.S. military industrial complex in the region, and obviously you have the long, you know, sordid history of nuclear tests. So all of these have, uh, you know. Uh, compounded to a sort of uh, economic and developmental backwardness uh, that these countries are facing. So definitely they want the U.S. to uh, send in more aid, uh, more economic uh, help that can actually uh, help them, uh, you know, develop further, keep up with the pace uh, of the some of their neighbors, including Australia and New Zealand. And uh, also for the U.S., to continue having any kind of military arrangement with them. So they pretty much use the kind of influence that China is having, the growing influence that China is having in the region as a leverage against the US at this point. So that really uh, is the reason why this, about 6.7 billion of the requested budget is basically what they call as economic aid, a general economic aid of different sort, which these three countries would be in many ways be free to uh, choose and you know do whatever they want to. Um, Anish, but the United States has also used this language, predatory states and so on and so forth. What is that a reference to? So, yeah, so uh, the US official uh, who's, uh, you know, mediating this deal right now uh, stated that this budget will be uh, used to counteract predatory and coercive influence in the region. What they're obviously referencing to is the growing influence that China is having. Uh, especially of what happened with Solomon Islands recently with the security train deal uh, being signed very recently between China and Solomon Islands after a couple of years after uh, Solomon Islands reverted its stance on, you know, between China and Taiwan and established diplomatic relations. So obviously this is coming at that point in time uh, where Pacific is becoming this sort of uh, a chessboard of sorts uh, between uh, superpowers to exert their influence. In the case of the United States, especially, uh, this is something that is way far off their region, their hemisphere even. And uh, this attempt to exert influence is basically to counteract a growing uh, developing power. And in that sense, uh, for them, uh, for their influence to remain in the Pacific, it has its own colonial and imperialist baggage to begin with. So this is something that is uh, a sort of double uh, hypocrisy uh, on the part of the United States to call, uh, you know, China's influence as coercive or uh, predatory. But uh, in this case, at least, uh, this influence was the reason why the U.S. is now uh, kind of ready. We are we have not reached a final deal, which will only happen by the end of the year. There is plenty of uh, more ground to cover. Uh, but definitely the fact that $7 billion is now um, up uh, for offer is uh, because uh, China has the significantly uh, growing influence in the region. And that is the reason why this has happened. And these countries have used that to their advantage 
obviously there are other lot of other factors and issues that need to be covered including uh, reparations and maybe a formal apology that Marshall Islands is calling for uh, for the nuclear tests that happened in Bikini at all. Uh, but all of that uh, we can see maybe in the next coming months. There is a certain level of compromise that the United States is ready to do at this point because of the geostrategic location of the region, obviously. Right, Anish. Thanks a lot for joining us. The World Athletics Council has banned transgender women who have gone through male puberty from competing in female world events from 31st March. It defended the ban, saying it would protect the female category. A working group will conduct further research into the eligibility guidelines for transgender persons. It has also voted to reduce permitted blood testosterone levels below 2.25 nanomoles per litre in intersex athletes. Sports journalist Siddhant Ani joins us with more detail. Siddhant, uh, good to have you back on the show. Um, Siddhant, can you just tell me what is the basis for World Athletics' decision? Uh, it, it seems sort of like a very exclusionary sort of uh, choice to make. Uh, and how does it affect the Olympics? Uh, so, so one of the ground, it's a very good question that you've asked, Pagya, because at this point, uh, what the reasoning was to take this decision is, is quite unclear. There was no real uh, sort of pressure or impetus of any kind. There was already a ban in place on uh, male to female uh, transgender uh, athletes uh, above 800 meters. So essentially, that decision or that previously existing ban was to target specific athletes, uh, athletes such as Castor Semenya, who uh, have been fighting against this exclusionary uh, policy that uh, what used to be called the IAAF and now known as World Athletics uh, has been following. Uh, and what they've done is to kind of uh, the language that they are using, uh, you know, they're using language like they, this is being done to preserve the integrity uh, of uh, of female competitions, female athletics. Uh, but on the other hand, the impact of this is likely to forget about what happens at the Olympics at the elite level, right? Because by the time you get to that stage, perhaps athletes also have a bit more agency, a bit more ability to fight the system to, to at least have their voices heard. But what this will do is essentially include uh, anyone who has gone through uh, male puberty and is then uh, transitioning. Uh, from competing at any kind of organized sports at any level. So whether it's in your hometown or your state or your district or your, uh, you know, uh, even within the country somewhere, uh, you will be automatically excluded from all of those competitions, anything that comes under any kind of organized uh, athletics. So which will also then trickle into uh, school systems, university systems, uh, creating an overall environment that is absolutely the opposite of the kind of inclusion that uh, people like Sebastian Coe, who lead or are the leading figures in global sports administration, keep talking about using sport as a tool to unite people, to uh, you know, to promote discourse, to promote uh, conversations, to promote peace, even uh, in the context of now, particularly the Russia-Ukraine war, where again they have used uh, sort of made political decisions but couched in language that indicates uh, that some kind of uh, greater good that they are trying to achieve through through all of this. So, so, so very hard to understand the timing of it, uh, very hard to figure out uh, what was the motivation to do this, uh, except that the World Championships are coming up and perhaps they needed to put it in place before then. Is this also a sort of politically guided uh, uh, decision? Is that what you're suggesting? I think so, uh, Pragya, because, you know, it kind of feeds very well into uh, conservative narratives around uh, trans people uh, in, in any sphere of, of life, uh, you know, uh, and, edu and it is already a space uh, or, or many of these spaces are already highly uh, exclusive or do don't include, uh, you know, don't allow any representation uh, of that entire community. So uh, it also feeds into sort of gender binary narratives that uh, conservative media professionals, conservative politicians uh, often uh, sort of uh, stick to uh, very strongly. So, so yeah, it is, it is uh, definitely a political uh, move uh, for sure. Even if you look at the kind of people who are coming out in support or the kind of net, uh, you know, media networks that are coming out and supporting uh, this ban, 
uh, you'll find that many of them are uh, conservative and definitely on, on uh, towards the right of the political spectrum. So, uh, so, so in that sense, yeah, it is pandering to uh, a core constituency, which, uh, which you know, is uh, I suppose uh, in that sense, as as most things are uh, dominated by white Western uh, people uh, at administrative levels, as well as uh, those who are competing in many of these uh, disciplines. Uh, you know, people like uh, Duthi Chand, Castro Semenya, they have been at the forefront of the, the legal battle, the long-running legal battle. Uh, Duthi Chand uh, is a sprinter from India. She's done several, uh, they've done several interviews uh, where, you know, they've talked about testosterone not being the only factor. And of course, it's true that the science is developing on this front, but it's not purely a science thing. I think uh, it's a lot more to do with uh, discourse and and conversation and 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 of course the political will to be inclusive that I think is at the bottom or or, or a main thing in this entire conversation and somehow that part is being lost in the in the entire conversation around it as well and when it when it when it again is voiced in terms of things like uh, preserving the integrity of the competition and all of that it makes it all that more much more hurtful. Uh, you know, two people who are being excluded, uh, and and in this case, to an entire community. Right, Siddhant, and thanks a lot for joining us. So, yeah, thank you. And that's all we have for you today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. Do come back to us tomorrow. You can visit our website for more People's Dispatch stories and watch our regular updates on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.